Okay, I, I'm Jeff Burgess. I work at the Web3 Foundation. I do a lot of protocol design. Um, so, uh, okay, I'm going to talk about uh, verifiable sort of verifiable luck is the name of the title. I'm really going to be talking about, so, sorry, one second. We're going to be talking about verifiable random functions. So uh, intuitively, you want to think about these things as basically there. So we have pseudo random function. What is a pseudo random function? It's a it's a hash function where we sort of distinguish a key. We think about it as uh, we assume that we're sort of pulling a random function from a family by this key. And uh, intuitively, a verifiable random function is just this, but where the key is a public uh, secret key pair. Now, I'm not going to give a formal definition, but um, intuitively what they're doing is they're, they're sort of gluing uh, a PRF onto, uh, onto some signature scheme. And the, these things are supposed to be functions, which means that if we have a particular public key and an input, then the output should be unique. And, the, um, and they should be pseudo random, which means that um, you know, if I haven't looked into the function, uh, you know, I can't sort of uh, think about the whole function all at once. If I haven't looked at a particular value yet, then I don't know what it will be, even without, even with the secret key, even if I know the secret key, and the thing should be hard to compute even with the secret, key, even without the, or sorry, it should be hard to compute at all without the secret key. Um, so these things are quite useful in a number of uh, distributed protocols. And the main reason I wanna talk about them is basically that they, they're oftentimes they're a nice place where we can say, okay, we're gonna, we could design this protocol using some MPC or some other thing, but we're just gonna design it using a verifiable random function instead. And this, um, it oftentimes gives a nicer um, distinction between sort of, well, for one thing, it gives a nicer distinction between sort of who works on which parts of the protocol. Like you can, you can have somebody does the stuff related to the VRF and somebody else does uh, something more related to the network. And there, there's a bit less in, in integration a lot of times. Um, uh, hopefully this will become a little bit clearer later in the talk. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is sort of how do you build these things. So uh, a, a classic example is RS. Is RSA is deterministic. RSA is not that secure, but and most of the padding systems that we use for RSA to make it secure add some the signer adds some randomness, which makes it not a VRF. Um, if I take RSA with a full domain hash, then this is both secure and it's deterministic. And so what I can do is so so then I have this nice property of this uniqueness property. And then what I can do is I when I if I hash the RSA signature with the message, then that looks a lot like this. If we assume this this hash function is a PRF, then this thing is a v, is a VRF. Um, okay, so this this property of sort of this doing this extra hash at the end, not just using the signature itself, is um, it's not something you always need to do. It's possible the signature has the kind of randomness properties you would want, but basically you should do it because in this kind of applied cryptographic sense of, well, let's just do it. And, you know, sometimes it's important and, you know, it, it lets us give, it gives us a way to sort of put out a, um, I guess I would say a more universally usable primitive. Okay. So how do we get this? How do we build one of these things with elliptic curves? So you need some kind of hash to curve function, or for most designs, you need a hash to curve function. So this is something you take uh, your message and, and it gives you out uh, an elliptic curve point that, is into, that you believe is sort of drawn at random from the elliptic curve uh, if the message is random. And um, what we do is our, we have a signature scheme that proves the correctness of multiplying the secret key by this, this elliptic curve point. Which is not the usual base point for the for the public key. Um, so this thing, a good name for it is the pre-output, and the reason you want to call it that is because a lot of times, like I just said, we want to a lot of times we want to be hashing um, this this in the RSA case the sig the whole signature, or but in this case just the pre-output with the message itself to actually claim this thing as a VRF, and um, developers, if they're just given this pre-output detached, will often just use it directly. So conceivably, they break something some, sometimes. And we've made that mistakes in, and had to do network upgrades because of this and other things. Um, so, um, and, and I also want to point out that a lot of academics have made the mistake 
they write when they write down when they formalize um, what a VRF is, they they also make the mistake of having this pre-output be detached. And again, this this just creates confusion. It's best if just the way if we if we write it as just um, you know the verify function returns the actual output and it does whatever it's supposed to do internally with this pre-output. Okay, so apologies for going a little bit fast through this part of the talk. Um, I kind of want to give some intuition behind these things and when you should be using them. Uh, one other thing I want to point out here is so that while BLS uh, matches this notion, uh, it, you know, it fits perfectly this notion of how we use these things with elliptic curves. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of baggage there of people using it wrong, and it's also usually not the fastest thing. Uh, so sometimes you may want it for whatever reasons, for protocol design reasons, but it's that the, those situations are actually kind of rare. Um, instead, what people usually want to do is they want some kind of, they just want to do a fiat Shamir transform of, a, of some Sigma protocol that does exactly the same, proving the pre-output of the secret key multiply, applied by, the, by this point hash to the curve. What does this look like? Um, so one form of it is, uh, there's a few different forms. There's, a, there's one that is in this IRTF draft by Ian Goldberg, and the, the same thing was before, was in the NSEC 5 paper and in the, this uh, VE25519 uh, specification. Um, the, another slightly, just very slightly different thing that you can do is you can just uh, do sort of one Schnorr proof uh, that, that the, um, the, the pre-output is correct. And there the verification equation looks exactly like verifying, almost exactly like verifying a Schnorr signature. Uh, the only caveat, if you do it this way, is sometimes you may need a, PO, a proof of knowledge on your public key. Okay, so I think that's all I really want to talk about in sort of instantiating these things. Um, what I really want to tell you about is card games. So what are these things good for? So basically what VRFs do is they give you an information asymmetry. So I have, um, you know, there, there's, I have something I, uh, I, you know, maybe I have something I, I want to reveal at some point in time, but I don't want to reveal it too early. Uh, you know, I don't want to, anyway, <laughs> read into that what you will with the, with these card games. Um, so we're going to use some cards, to the extent possible, we're going to use cards against cryptography as the example, because that's the, we're sort of, this event is nominally associated with real world crypto, and that's sort of is the, the game of re real world crypto. So, Okay, how do we verifiably draw cards? So um, uh, multi-party computation is, is harder. So what we're going to do is a simplifying assumption. We're gonna just make our deck, decks of cards infinite with uh, in infinitely many repetitions of N basic cards. So there won't be any, we can't do much counting cards in these games. And that's fine. I mean, the, the number of people who are any good at counting cards is, is a minority. So the game only becomes less fun for them. Um, so in general, the rule is that to draw a card, well, okay, when you, do, when you, have a, when you play an actual card game, you're drawing cards from, uh, you know, from this, these face down cards in a deck. So there's this randomness in the deck that you're just pulling from. Now what we're going to have is we're going to have some public randomness, and this VRF is going to turn it into private randomness for you. And uh, the verifiability comes from the fact that everybody believes the public randomness. Um, okay, so there's this public randomness, which we'll call turn seed, and you draw a card by evaluating the VRF on turn seed, and you just give the, and when you then later need to prove that you drew that card in the past, you give the signature of it, and people can check it. All right. So we're going to, assuming, so there's a question of how do we evolve the turn seed, because we need the turn seed to become uh, to be, you, you know, you don't want to know what you're going to have in the future as your turn seed. So we need the previous player or somehow, somehow to uh, obtain the turn seed. And we'll just assume the players aren't colluding. And, and so you can get the previous, the, the turn seed by using the, the previous player running their VRF a second, another time, uh, you know, in some other context uh, to give you a turn seed. Now, if you want something that's a bit more robust against collusion, you can use the stuff that Mary Mahler is going to talk about later. Okay, and anyway, and so now we just verify these draws. As I already said, we verify them with, uh, we have sign and verify algorithms for them. Okay. Oops, can I just run? Okay, so 
Um, one just general piece of intuition about using these things is that um, in a, a signature, uh, in a signature scheme, the normally the semantics are improved by signing a large, putting more into the message that we sign. And with VRFs are basically the opposite. Um, you want to have, you want to sign less. And if you looked on the previous slide, the only thing I was signing was turn seed and maybe some index into like how many I'm supposed to be drawing. Um, so a way you can think about this is that there's some cards which are just going to be massively better than most other cards in the deck. And if I can, you know, if I can modify, if there's any other information besides turn seed in the VRF input, then I can just, you know, the user can tweak that until they find one that benefits them. And, you know, maybe draw this card that makes fun of the NSA and that can play with most of the, uh, that can play against most of the black cards very nicely. So, um, all right, so our, our VRF input is almost only the turn seed, and then perhaps, you know, if we're supposed to draw some fixed number of other cards. So uh, examples of games that work very well in this is, say, say Uno or Crazy Eights. Um, you know, then what happens is the previous player uh, says how many cards you're supposed to draw based on the card that they, drew, they played. And um, so that will determine num draws. And then they also, you know, they also reveal the turn seed. So when they play these two, th play their card and reveal their turn seed, your what you you can do is is sort of fixed. Uh, all you can do is sort of pick what you're going to draw from your pick what you're going to do from uh, to the next person. All right. Uh, one other caveat: I'll make the NPC. Well, the NPCs are. You can, there are shuffling things for NPCs that are probably not that much harder than for addressing collusion, but that's another topic. Okay, so let's talk about a real protocol very quickly. Um, so, okay, so as I said, these VRFs, what they're basically doing, they're creating an information asymmetry. They're turned, they're, you know, we were, and in general, we can use them in a lot of probabilistic algorithms. So, um, DNSSEC, basically, what the problem in DNSSEC is we have. Uh, a non-authoritative name server. We have an authoritative name server somewhere, and we have a non-authoritative name name server that actually needs to uh, deliver answers to users without go contacting the authoritative one. So, um, what NSEC three does to try and make so, of course, if the record exists, it's no problem. You just deliver the record. But if the record doesn't exist, then you have to prove that it doesn't exist. So the way NSEC three does this is that you hash all the names. You, you have some some key, some public some key and or just a string and you hash all the names with this string and that creates an ordering of them and then the authoritative one signs all the pairs and you and then when a user asks for a zone the um, the the non-authoritative name server says oh the symmetric key for the hash is this and so here's your here's where your hash landed and here's the two nearest hashes of names. But um, we don't really want people to know all the subdomains of a domain. And again, with that, because it's just a hash and the key is even exposed, they can just use, build a rainbow table and find all the and find all the the names under all the zones in a you know, all the domain names in a particular zone. So um, what? Uh, NSEC 5 does is it just replaces this hash with a VRF. We still, and so now what happens is um, when somebody asks for a zone, it, the non-authoritative name server, it doesn't have the, the, you know, sort of zone signing key, but it does have the VRF secret key. So it gives them back a proof that the VRF of their particular request is a, some, has some particular value. And then it gives them also uh, the signature by the authoritative GNOME server that the two closest, um, that the two clo uh, adjacent um, real domains have certain VRF values. And now there's no way you can attack this even with rainbow tables because you have to actually make a request for every single evaluation of this VRF. All right, so what is the card game version of this? Uh, well, it's actually kind of go fish. So again, we have two public keys. Um, and what happens is that, um, so Alice has just taken her turn. 
Bob is going to take his turn. Alice doesn't reveal turn seed just yet. Uh, Bob sort of picks who he, what request he wants to make. He asks Carol, okay, I want all of your threes. And um, then when he makes his request, Alice, um, let's see. So then when he makes his request, uh, Alice can reveal turn seed and Carol can, uh, Carol has previously um, published the VRFs of all the cards in her deck. So what she can do is she can just take Bob's request, evaluate the VRF using her SK, using her SK prime and give, uh, give uh, Bob back a proof that, um, that there's nothing there. And then he has to go draw with whatever um, the turn seed was that Carol gave him. So, and then there's a bit more complexity here because you could get some cards later and whatever, but uh, you know, basically this is, basically this makes some kind of sense. So, okay, so that's cute. So we can, there's a, there's a funny parallel between NSEC five and go fish. Uh, very briefly, what's sort of going on here is we're using, we're using these uh, VRFs to simulate a fog of war. Um, there's, a, there's a nice paper, but not in the kind of the real time strategy sense. If you want something on that, there's a paper called Open Conflict by Mike Hamburg and others, uh, which it uses obli oblivious PRFs though, which is a different thing and we're not gonna talk about. Okay, so I should say a little tiny bit about Polkadot here. And so what I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna explain to you how to view Polkadot, uh, a small a piece, but a very important piece of Polkadot as a card game. So we have, um, the idea is we have M players and they all draw some cards from one of these infinite decks uh, with um, N cards. You could think of the cards as having different pictures on them or representing different teams or whatever. Then all the players socialize. So, but each player is drawing multiples of these things. And then the players socialize, they can go have a drink, they can decide if they're gonna cheat or not, whatever. And after the socialization round, all players have, um, they, have they also have some honest and cheat betting cards, which they then attach to each of their, to label each of their team cards. And, um, and then once that happens, once everybody has labeled their team cards, then we reveal um, the uh, uh, we reveal all these pairs of of face or of team and uh, betting cards. And if so, if a team has so now this is when if you're honest, this is when you learn who your teammates are. And maybe you cheated and figured out who your teammates were in the socialization round. Um, so if a particular team has 100% honest, then all the players get a point, whatever a point is. And if a particular team has 100% cheat cards, then those players win. And, um, but if anybody's cheating on a team that has mixed, uh, then they lose. Okay. And in general, this last line here, this description of, of, uh, of, sharding is, is kind of this, fin this finish of the game is a description of sort of the, um, the finish of a sharding protocol. So something like what Ethereum 2 wants to use or what, uh, or what Bitcoin wants to, you know, Brian Ford's Bitcoin paper does. Okay, so I'm not gonna say too much more about this. This is not the most fun card game. Maybe we can try and design a more fun card version of Polkadot, a more fun version of Polkadot, but anyway. What I do want, the other, the main thing I wanna tell you about is um, this. So we, we often reveal information by not playing certain cards. So as a cards of crypt cryptography example, um, you know, if this black card comes out and, and, I and I had one of these cards in my deck and I chose not to play it, maybe that says something about me. Um, so, you know, um, but, the problem is, is that this, these turn seeds, we were just keeping track of them in a public database so that we can check them when people do their proofs that they had a card later, um, that we, we were just pulling these turns, we were just looking them back up in a public database. So then we know exactly when a player drew the card. And so we might wanna hide that. And we can hide that using a zero knowledge proof. Um, there's something else though. Um, perhaps more important than this, and especially more important for cards against cryptography, is actually, it's not so, so in cards against cryptography, I don't really need to hide when I drew a card, because in most variants, I just draw them all at the beginning. 
um, what what what's um, what's more important is to hide who played each card. So I want to prove that this is the valid card without revealing who played it. And um, so the the major problem actually with the VRFs that we've been talking about is that they hid the they hid the player when I make or they don't they reveal the player when they make the player makes the signature. Like I said, though, VRFs are kind of just PRFs stuck into signature schemes. And we actually know a lot of an anonymized signature schemes. So we have group signatures where the signer um, is using some kind of uh, certificate scheme or a certificate they hold to, uh, to then prove that they have a public key and make a signature with that public key. This is very efficient. Uh, th these are quite fast, actually. They're not so efficient for the verifier, but for the prover, they're very efficient. And there's a lot of different ones. Uh, there's a nice survey page, survey like book on them. Um, ring signatures are a bit different. Um, they the signer uh, they want to prove that the sign the signer wants to prove that they sit in a particular set of signer, and usually the set is actually specified by the signer. Though increasingly there's um, things that are kind of part way between group signatures and ring signatures, where the signer doesn't really get to choose their set. And this is Zcash's system is an example of this. It's it's implemented like a ring signature, but it gives you a group signature like property, but without needing a cert but using a um, a commitment instead of a certificate. Um, so there's sort of three variants here, and then the other thing that we have is we have what are called linkable ring signatures, or we can talk about linkable for any of these. And uh, what this does basically it proves that if if I use the same key twice. And it reveals this fact. And the way a way to do that, and what's commonly done in linkable ring signatures, is to, as part of the thing, you multiply the secret key times some other base point and prove that you've done that correctly. And that actually is exactly what we need for a VRF. So if I'm making most kinds of link, linkable ring signatures, just give me an or, or linkable group signatures, whatever, give me an anonymized VRF. And that so that means that the signer essentially proves they lay, they're in the set of players and they reveal uh, the secret key times the what, whatever the message is hashed to the curve. Um, you can implement these in a snark directly. This particular snark you can implement in, I don't know, less than 4,000 constraints. I think we have it below 3,000. And you can do a lot of optimizations that make it even more efficient than that. So this is, while it's a lot heavier than a group signature, it's not really that bad. Um, the um, and you know the verifiers checking a few pairings. So what does this all tell us? So an anonymous basically an anonymized VRF plus Tor lets us play verifiable cards against cryptography. Okay. Um, so sort of to start wrapping up here, um, I'll give you another use for these anonymized VRFs. So. All right, we have identity systems on the internet um, and we have this open ID thing that a lot of people use. And it probably makes sense for Stack Exchange where they sort of control the whole bunch of sites themselves. And it doesn't, you know, but it's also being used by Facebook Connect and Google, you know, Facebook Connect is this and Google single sign-on. And um, this, these represent kind of a big ethical problem. And, you know, you, you can, we have a nice picture here of Facebook Connect. Um, the there is a proposal to improve these things. A, a lot of proposals have come forward to improve these things, but most of them don't make a lot of sense. In particular, um, so the W3C uh, has this like verifiable, you know, the W3C is not doing great things lately. They have these encrypted media extension, garbage and other things that are quite problematic. But they all, amongst this, they have this verifiable claims group uh, in which users sort of, Basically, the point is that users reveal certificates about themselves. And uh, what can go wrong? So many, many things can go wrong in this design. So there can be identity theft. There can be, you know, if, if I'm proving, if I'm supposed to prove that I have, uh, have a college degree to access a certain website, well, clearly this is going to create discrimination, blah, blah, blah. I can, you know, this is a long top, long discussion. But basically, the core thing is that there's a lot of details here that people about users that sites don't, websites don't need to know in any sort of general purpose identity system. Or, and 
the um, so okay one proposal that's put forward to try and fix this design about revealing certificate you know where users reveal certificates about themselves is these CL signatures which you can re-randomize and you can just reveal part of what is being certified so you can uh, just reveal certain attributes of the user again this doesn't really help because what will happen is the sites will just want more and more attributes and in the end the users will lose their privacy anyway and now they'll still just be proving that they have a driver's license and you know that was issued in a certain year and blah 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 and it will be a mess so um can we do better actually yes so brian ford and many other people have pointed out that all that a service so the most that a service wants is to most the, the most the most services have any right to expect is that um, uh, users only have a unique account on that service. So they just want to prevent civil, civil attacks. And a lot of services don't even want that. A lot of times they can get by with something much weaker. Um, but for the strongest, so if, for example, an example of something that's weaker is Cloudflare's privacy pass. That just proves that the user has done, you know, an answer to CAPTCHA sometime in the recent past. But in, in the case we want this very strong, you know, identity system, which nevertheless doesn't cross the line into being unethical, um, we just use an anonymized VRF. We put all the users into, into the signer set. And um, now when the, the user gets a request from the identity, from, for their identity from some domain, uh, their browser, their machine checks the cert TLS certificate of that domain that the identity, the request is coming from the right place, and 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 it also checks that the uh, user is okay with being unique on that domain. And if these things are true, then uh, then it just returns an anonymous VRF signature whose input is the domain. And now the domain can 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 verify it, and they know. Then that verification just gives them the user's identity. Um, so this is being used in this proof of personhood parties designed by Brian Ford's Status Group. We should use it a lot, quite much more broadly. Um, we're also talking. We'll also use it eventually in Polkadot's block production for a uh, uh, semi-anonymous single leader election scheme. And um, anyway, the, the general thing that I want people to take home from this talk is that thinking about things as a VRF, it's a very good way to structure your protocols to sort of avoid too much MPC. And it's also a very good way to structure your snarks. If you need a snark somewhere, you can think about, okay, there's, there's a particular input and a particular output that's supposed to be unique for that input. And then I can just glue on other logic alongside it. And this will, Structuring things in this way will let us, um, it will let us sort of bring, you know, devs with different expertise to building different parts of the problem. A dev who's better at dealing with the network layer can say, okay, this is just a VRF. I've been told these things work like that. And, you know, we can have somebody else build the snark. Okay, um, that's it. Thank you, Jeff. Are there any questions? So maybe I'll get started. Uh, so when you talk about the ID systems and unethical, can you, you mentioned the problems and I can uh, envision that, but can you elaborate on that when you talk about the, the problems which are present with the, the uh, ID systems? Would you uh, basically, the point is, why should users be, I mean, basically, we don't want users clicking, uh, you know, it's, it's bad enough that users give their real names to sites, it's worse if they can't lie. Um, it's, it's bad enough that users, uh, you know, say they're, um, you know, it, you know, it, it gets worse if they're proving that they're old enough to drive, if they're proving that they're, they have a college degree, and sites start discriminating against this, it, this isn't, um, in general, we don't want this information pollution. You know, it's better that sites know less about what you know what their users do, who they are, etc. Um, so there's a question here. Um, 
I'm sorry, if that didn't answer your question, ask it again. No, that's fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, it, there's, is, there's a question here about a post-quantum VRF. So not, uh, I'm actually not completely sure. So isogenies give you one that's, that they're incredibly slow. Um, the uh, hash-based signatures give you uh, post-quantum VRFs, but they're very large. Um, Lattice-based signatures, so there's a paper, there was a recent, paper by I think Algorand on a, a lattice based VRF but it's not small and it's really bad because it exposes its secrets key after a certain number of usages so I wouldn't use that I think there's some other um, I think the short answer is not really um, but when I'm remember I said hash based signatures are large if I'm willing so Ethereum had this idea of using this thing called Randall which is basically a VRF of domain one. It's easy to make a hash-based signature that um, can only be used a certain limited number of times. So something that's stateful. And this can be quite small and quite extremely fast. And um, so if you really needed a post-quantum VRF right now, uh, you would use basically a stateful hash-based signature. And this is pretty compact and whatever. But it's not going to give you this anonymized anonymized VRF uh, notion. There's also another question. Um, it says, is it fair to summarize your point as because VRF only supports limited disclosure, basically ring signature functionality? I'm a member of a set, but as general snark encourages disclosing all sorts of other metadata. I'm, for example, I'm from a college and uh, over 30. That is prevents yeah. the temptation for devs to support disclosing more. Oh yeah, so certainly for standardizing, I think you don't really want to um, expose all that other stuff. So the specific thing that I was talking about in that context, so people are, um, the specific proposals that are being talked about for when they even talk about strange crypto, uh, the, the specific proposals that most people who talk about um, these distributed identity things or verifiable claims on them, what the, their, their proposals are of the form, um, you know, well, we'll just reveal whatever attributes the users want. So they're actually not even revealing anything unique. So the only way that a site can use that service to prove uniqueness of its users is to ask for more and more um, attributes. Um, so that's one point is that we should be using, you need the anonymized VRF component of the snark just to get this desibling property at all without causing a problem. And then as far as other, whether you disclose other attributes, I would strongly discourage disclosing any other attributes, but conceivably sometimes there's a use case where they make sense. Um, you know, that, that's a, what I would say is that if you need to disclose another attribute in a snark that's meant for an identity thing, um, it should kind of, perhaps it should be tied to the TLS certificate. So the, when the website, like if, if I want to run a porn website and I really want to restrict my users to people who have this anonymized VRF identity system and, and they're over 18, then I just say um, in my TLS certificate, I'm allowed to, I'm only, a, you know, any requests that come from this uh, site must prove over 18. And so then there's not really uh, any threat anymore of that over 18 bit leaking information about the user because they're all in that group. Um, but that's a, you know, those things are generally a niche use case. Most people like, you know, if you want to be most, there, there's other kinds of identity systems for when you like um, for when you have a relationship with an institution, like when you're, it's your bank or you're going to, you're studying there. And these are different, they're covered by existing law, existing laws. And we don't really, you know, we don't necessarily need identity systems that cover the, you know, new fancy identity systems that cover those use cases. I'm, did that answer your question? Yep, yeah, that's good, thanks. Okay, if there are no more questions. Um, thank you, Jeff, again, for your talk. And then we can move on to the next uh, speaker.